Welcome to Schweitzer Drive, a podcast where we explore what goes on between the generation of electricity and the light switch. Join Dave Whitehead as he interviews the entrepreneurs, innovators, and experts who are inventing the future of electric power. Well, hello, I'm David Costello. I'm the Chief Sales and Services Officer here at SEL, and it is my honor to be the guest host of this episode of the Schweitzer Drive podcast. And I'm delighted, and it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. James Merlot uh, as our guest for this episode. I've known James now for about 10 years. He's a, he's a good friend and highly respected in his field, so I'm looking forward to this talk, James, and learning more from you. Uh, as a way of introduction... Let me explain a bit of James's background. Uh, James is an expert in human performance. He began this journey at the United States Military Academy at West Point in New York, of course, earning a Bachelor's of Science in Human Factors Psychology. And this was followed by a Master's in Engineering Psychology from the University of Illinois and a Ph.D. in Applied Experimental and Human Factors Psychology from the University of Central Florida. Dr. Merlot then served for 22 years in a variety of leadership roles in the U.S. Army, including several combat tours in Desert Storm and Operation Iraqi Freedom, and being the Deputy Brigade Commander in Baghdad, earning the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and even serving as an Assistant Professor at West Point. After his service to our country in the military, and, and by the way, James, thank you very much for your service, uh, Dr. N. Then Lieutenant Colonel retired Merlot served for eight years as vice president and director of the Reliability Risk Management Department at NERC or the North American Reliability Corporation. And that's our regulator for the electric power industry in North America. In this role, James and his team led NERC's efforts to assess industry vulnerabilities with respect to the bulk electric system. And it was in this capacity that James began teaching how human performance affects power system reliability. And he and his team, of course, created the NERC Human Performance Conference to allow industry thought leaders and practitioners a forum in which to learn and share with the ultimate goal of making our critical power grid safer and more reliable. And, of course, at that conference, that's that's how I came to know uh, James. In 2019, uh, James joined Knowledge Vine. He's the vice president of operational excellence there. James, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. Well, David, thanks for that introduction. Gosh, I, it has been a long time. All that happened actually simultaneously. So uh, <laughs> thanks. It's great to be back at SEL. I've actually got a chance to visit you all there uh, several times, and uh, always a pleasure, always a huge education for me. Uh, I even got a chance to address uh, all the employees once for uh, the SEL lunch, which was quite impressive. Yes, you did. So great to be back, and, and thanks for that wonderful introduction. Yeah, you reminded me. You, you did address Friday lunch once and talked about the, the regulator's point of view, and it was great for all of our employee owners to hear that message. So let's get started. Um, James, share a little bit, if you will, about how you became interested in human performance as an area of study and, and for your career. Well, you know, David, it started uh, at the at West Point, like you were talking about. I was a young cadet trying to figure out what I wanted to study, and and uh, and this whole idea of explaining, predicting, and changing human behavior became very appealing to me. And and I never had taken a psychology class; it really wasn't offered in high school. And I, I dove into that, and of course, of course, I wanted to do everything. And there was only really about a half a dozen universities in the United States in the late '80s that offered a bachelor of science in this study of, of human factors engineering. And West Point was one of those places that offered that degree. And so well, I thought, what better place to understand human machine interface? I mean, that's what the military is. We give young people uh, instruments to, to go out and, and kind of take over the will of our country when diplomacy fails. And I thought, what, what better way to, to lead in the, in the service than to figure out ways to allow humans and machines to operate more or cohabitate in, in a more seamless manner? And so I studied, uh, you know, chose that as my uh, degree. I got a bachelor of science in it. And then uh, the rest just joined the army and we go do fun stuff in the army. And they kept allowing me to get more education. And I kept on getting more education. Sometimes I'd have to go deploy. And then it just kind of kept rolling together until I could actually teach it and got a chance to get my doctorate in it. So that's really where I got my interest was leading people and machines. And, and really that's, you know, it's the interface of human machines that, that our world's all about. So at a, at a very high level, can you 
can you give the audience a definition and maybe a summary of some of the the basic concepts of of the discipline of human performance and human factors engineering? Yeah, no, it's a great question, David, because it, you know people try to figure that out. You know, what does a human factors engineer do? Is you know, ask somebody if they liked building the bridge, and, and it's a. I used to say, I don't, I don't care whether you like your mom or not. I'll measure how fast you feel that way. But, but no, it's quite different than that. So really, it's we understand how humans see, hear, interface with the world. And so when we have that knowledge, why would we not build our machines such that they fit the, our understanding of human behavior? So if I can predict the way you're going to behave. So for example, if you and I are walking down the sidewalk, I know that you're going to deconflict with me. You're going to go right and I'm going to go right. Because that's what we know. That's how we operate on the road. That's how we operate. And so I can predict that behavior. And so that's what we do. But but if you and I change that context and we went to London and I try to deconflict with you by going to the right, well, our, our, our English counterpart would, would actually predictably go right into us because they're used to deconflicting in a different way. So if we understand human behavior, we understand it inside that context, we can design our systems such that we can catch that error. We can design a system where it will be that what the human naturally would do and not be as susceptible to error. And so where did the discipline come from? We actually studied aircraft accidents. And so we took the best and brightest. It was men in, in those days, just men that could fly. It, we didn't get real reliability in aircraft until we allowed women to fly as well. But but back in those days, it, it, during the, the World War II, when, when aircraft became so popular and we had to have them for military victory, we realized that the best and brightest, you know, fastest reflex people we're making very, very bad errors in these aircraft. But we also realized that when they were very predictable because the engineers were designing the aircraft sort of independent of the way the human thought, the way the human was going to behave. And so when we study those accidents, then we could we figured, hey, then we can start to design things such that when the human only has 10 seconds or, their, or the rest of their life to figure this incident out, let's do what we, we can predict. Let's make it where we can predict what they're going to do and what they do will be the right choice. And so we became fascinated by the study of when humans made errors, could we design systems to be either more error tolerant or to make them where they were less likely to create the conditions where a human would make that error. So, so that's what we do is we study humans, we try to explain and predict their behavior, change their behavior if necessary, but more importantly, change the system such that it really is more adapting to the human behavior. Good. Thanks for that explanation. Uh, you know, after your after your uh, military service, then you decided to move into the electric power industry. And I'm, I'm curious to hear you explain a little bit about your thought process and what led you to the electric power industry. At West Point, we had to take lots of different engineering courses. And uh, I really enjoyed my electrical engineering courses. I had a great, uh, my, great professors there. Actually, the head of the, of the electrical engineering department was on the board of trustees at NERC. Uh, Jerry Colley, our CEO at NERC at the time, was a West Point graduate. And as I was looking at what, you know, everybody usually goes into the defense industry when they leave the defense, and I realized that, wait a minute, I really am ready to give back. And the electrical industry uh, really seemed like a fascinating place. And, and what a great choice it was, having no idea really what I was in for when I got into the electrical industry. But I found that they were extremely receiving, great team players, almost like the military as far as the camaraderie, because these are the people that are that are making it happen between the generation of electricity and the light switch. And they love what they do. They recognize the importance of it. And to be part of that community, I feel like I was very well received early on. And when I could try to told them that I was an advocate of trying to prevent human error and uh, trying to understand the system, they absolutely uh, were more than willing to explain it to me. And I was more than willing to listen. And for me, it was just a marriage made in heaven. Well, that's that's uh, perhaps an obvious connection after listening to you speak a little bit is that both in the military and the electric power industry, humans work in stressful and potentially dangerous and often evolving and changing work environments. So um, there's a there's a real need to improve that environment performance in the environment. And there's also a real strong connection to to the purpose here at SEL that that I find uh, important, the why we go to work, and that's to make electric power safer and more reliable. So uh, I guess transitioning a little bit to your time at, at NERC, James, uh, you worked at, at NERC for more than eight years. And for our listeners who who may not know a lot about that organization or its charter, we, we explain a little bit about what NERC is and does and what your role was and, and maybe an interesting 
uh, part of this is what do you consider some of your biggest accomplishments while, while you were there? Well, so, so NERC was actually my first civilian job after, after uh, West Point. So it was uh, after the military, my military career. So it was really uh, eye-opening for me, again, like you talked about, the importance of electricity. I mean, nothing happens, at least in the military, we say nothing happens until somebody moves. Well, I would say in the, in the in the North America today, nothing happens until somebody turns the light switch on, right? I mean, electricity really is everything. It's, it's, uh, it's our hospitals. It's our running water you know, uh, I love it. The one time that you can see the actual interconnection move is during the Super Bowl because everyone flushes their toilet at exactly the same time <laughs> during the Super Bowl. And so you can actually see yes, see that. And, and somebody says, well, how does flushing the toilet matter? Well, because you have to run those giant water pumps, the mm-hmm. municipal water pumps. So so electricity being such a, a vital part of North America. Uh, in 2003, we had the North American blackout where we saw cascading going across the Northeast. And so that's when lawmakers uh, came up with uh, Section 215, and they and through the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, there became the the idea that we needed a regulator. And so they regulate because electricity is such a large industry. They wanted a regulator that maybe wasn't exactly the federal government. So they built an insular layer called NERC, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, which really was a voluntary organization that goes back all the way to I think 60, 1964. Where there was this uh, just so much sharing going on within the industry, everybody was learning. I mean, the whole idea of electrification and, and the uh, interconnections. And as you know, we have four major interconnections in North America. Well, they said let's uh, let's come up with a regulator. So NERC became the overall regulator, and NERC had at that time eight regions. I think they're down to six now. And so they said we'll come up with these kind of mandatory standards so that we can explain and predict. Uh, behavior. So if we know what our neighbor is going to do, because we have some rules and some standards in place, it might make it a little bit more reliable for electricity. And, and indeed, I think we do believe it does, because there are some times within the interconnection that if you take a shortcut or there might be things that might may be beneficial for your state that aren't beneficial for others, uh, electricity doesn't really follow state boundaries as much as it does just the, electro, the electrical connection of the grid, and it, with the exception of Texas, which is actually its own air connection. But um, so anyway, they made these rules and regulations that are in place. So NERC is that that standing body that produces the uh, the industry actually produces them through NERC the standards, and then they're expected to be followed. And there's a series of standards, everything from uh, from actual uh, planning standards to uh, execution of uh, facilities ratings, things like uh, how close lines can get to other lines, how much uh, vegetation can encroach on, and this is mostly your your hundred. Uh, kilovolts and, and above. So things like uh, your bright line, like your transmission systems, not mm-hmm. really transmit, not distribution. That's really handled more by your public utility commission. But this is the big transmission, the stuff that's going interstate. It's really interesting. So they go in and audit that you follow these different standards and rules and regulations. And, and one of the byproducts was that was there was a little bit less um, uh, because now that you're getting audited and, and you don't want to necessarily admit when you maybe made an error and set a relay or you didn't have your batteries of your substations quite up to par for your backup power. Well, now you can suddenly get a million dollar fine. That's a million dollars a day fine for not following these reliability standards. So the concern is, was maybe people aren't going to share as much. It's going to be a little bit harder to learn things. And so so that's why NERC is there. It's sort of the watchdog of the grid. And of course, now that includes things like cybersecurity, where we're, we're very concerned about that being an issue. And, and SEL obviously is a major role in that as, more, as I mean, 90% of the relays in the bulk electric system are, are SEL relays. And so, so you asked me, David, what are the things I'm most proud of? Well, I'm most proud of the fact that, that we got in there and, and really uh, one of my Naval Academy uh, colleagues, Ben McMillan, we uh, really kind of went to back to starting board on root cause analysis and said, hey, here's the things we need to do when there's an event. Let's really analyze this. Let's lay it out in, in cause code. So some of the smaller events, we can start tracking what caused them. Uh, let's look at the, uh, not just, just the root cause, but what are the precipitating causes or what things, what context led to it? Was it cold weather? Was it, uh, was it hot weather? So let's look at the things that we can start to predict this behavior. And then most importantly, Let's produce lessons learned and let's share. Let's make sure this information is moving around because while we can certainly find a violation and we can make sure someone has to pay a fine for if they weren't compliant, that's all going to happen anyway. We have routine audits. There's plenty of data pools we can do for that. But what are we doing to make sure that 
if it was an innocent mistake, because they look, let's, the grid's constantly changing, right? It's evolving. Look at look at the number of renewables on the grid now as compared to to, to two years ago, much less ten years ago. So, so we really, what, I'm really proud of what we did in, in the events analysis with that after sharing with uh, we performance analysis, so we could start sharing what is a reasonable error rate in in your relay. Uh, you know, are the relays failing mechanically? Well, back during transistor relays, maybe they were, but when you start getting into digital relays, we find that the, the actual relays are extremely reliable. It's usually associated with human error. And then, then we pull the string. Is it really somebody fat fingered a setting or is it that maybe we didn't have a good understanding of how it was uh, connected with the other systems? In fact, I love it. You know, Ed Schweitzer talks about things being, uh, you know, complicated or complex, right? And so complicated, we can probably deal with. Complex is where we start to struggle as humans when we start looking at it, all those interconnections. So so what I'm most proud of is, is that we built a team uh, and really got into that. And then we realized that, hey, human performance is going to play a big role. So we started doing a human performance conference where where we met. And you now, David, we, we got the chance to publish, uh, Mike Moon published a paper with you all at SEL talking about the sharing of information and how important that it more important now probably than ever before. So we just kept going with it. And, and next thing you know, we were, uh, we had a human performance conference, 500 people at it, I think by year eight, I, I would say that, that my goal, personal goal there, which I, I think uh, I, I feel really good about was that we shrunk North America. We shrunk North America in the ability to share information, learn from each other and, and realize that probably it's not the last human who touched it that was at fault, that maybe we, there's something bigger, maybe there's a system that's involved and that we can really work on the system to set the next human up for success. And, uh, and I think we've done that. If we watch the misoperations rate, for example, fall every single year. So long answer to a short question, but uh, yeah, just a lot of fun to be able to go in there and say, look, electricity is really important. The grid's really important. The equipment's really important, but the most important part is those humans that interface with the system. And if we believe that the humans and the system can operate seamlessly together. And if we concentrate on that idea of continuous improvement and, and, and root cause analysis, not just to stop with, uh, with we found Bob, Bob's the last guy who touched it, so we'll go with him, uh, that we can probably uh, make much greater you know, stri- strikes. And I think strives, and I think we have. I think that you see the reliability of the grid. If, if the grid was 99.9% reliable, I think we would ha- be without electricity with about seven minutes every week. I mean, I think the average, looking at the data that I've seen from, you know, this is actually distribution data, the average family was without electricity seven minutes last year, and that's notwithstanding storms. Now, let's just go with straight blue sky days. You're looking at about seven minutes that the average family was without electricity in a year, and that's all over North America. That That's impressive. I mean, that that's absolutely impressive, and that just doesn't happen by accident, and that's well, well better than 99.9%. Yeah, so the results are the results are what what are truly important, and the 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 outage times being reduced, the uh, the the misoperation rates getting smaller and smaller, the reliability of the entire system improving is is really impressive. You know, there was a famous FERC ruling in two thousand nine against a Florida utility, and and uh, you mentioned the the audits and the fine, and I think we were maybe at a little bit darker time in the industry. That was an example of what I would. Uh, describe as heavy-handed enforcement and and the the whatever infraction might have occurred it, it was all locked down in a confidential settlement and in this compliance space and because of that the industry uh, it said was not afforded any opportunity to learn one of the biggest accomplishments was the shift to a, a so-called just culture where we self-identify self-report we share we learn from one another we we uh, we use root cause analysis and and through all of that, we're really binding ourselves around this shared mission of improving reliability. I guess shifting gears a little bit, James. Now you're at a company called Knowledge Vine, and for our listeners, would you help explain your role and and what exactly Knowledge Vine does? Well, so Knowledge Vine is a leader in in human performance and in a safety, and what we do is. Um, so it was it was fun as I got to work with so many different utilities. This idea of human performance kind of really evolved from you know I even talked about human factors. It evolved from coming uh, the study of aircraft accidents, and so it went into nuclear power where we kind of really had no room for errors. It went into nuclear power, and nuclear power uh, tried to uh, 
and they were able to do it. It was largely a, a large ex-military crowd, uh, very regimented, and they really could not afford people to to kind of take liberties. It was very procedure oriented, and they kind of came with this idea of human performance, and it worked very well inside the the uh, just the community, the nuclear community. But um, and it really, what I would say, in high reliability organizations, and I'll kind of talk about that in a second. But so um, a lot of these uh, folks that were the utilities were ready to start. Let's look at can we do this human performance? Maybe it doesn't look like exactly what it looks like in nuclear. Maybe it looks a little bit different. And when we get out into the regular transmission distribution world, and indeed it did. And so uh, David Bowman kind of retired, so to speak, from Entergy and started his own company. And, and many of our colleagues did. And David just was really on fire with this idea that we actually have to get in the field with these field workers. And so Knowledge Vine uh, is a human performance uh, provider. And so, yeah, we have, all the, you know, less classes on human performance and we have, uh, you know, there's multimedia classes that you can take and information. But but one of the things that made Knowledge Vine unique and which got my attention is they actually will go to the field and coach the workers through the use of human performance. And I was fascinated by that because, uh, I, being in the infantry for 26 years, I was very much into you, you can go so far with the textbook, you can go so far with the virtual learning, but you at some point have to go out and, and, and be a coach, right? Actually be there, share the hardship, inspect what you expect, right? Be in the field and get what you want by by being part of it. And uh, so Knowledge Vine was doing that. And so when I left uh, Merck, I joined Knowledge Vine and, and that's uh, we went from probably 11, 12 people to 100 people very quickly when people realize that we would get their hands dirty, actually show people what it is that we do uh, and and kind of set those expectations and then provide that coaching. Because what we really find is, is that even the best athletes in the world can all trace it back to the good coaches that they had that got them to that, that state of excellence. And so we believe that that, that good, open, fair coaching, uh, providing that feedback to folks in the field really makes all the difference in the world. And it's been very successful for us as a company. You know, James, one of the things you shared with me at, at Knowledge Vine is is how you've helped utilities uh, in particular prepare for big storms and then also, of course, to help with the recovery and service restoration after those big storms. So if you wouldn't mind, maybe share one of one or a few of the more interesting stories from uh, from those events and that activity. Yeah, so so a storm is really not any different than in some ways like a, a military event, right? Because in this case, the weather is your enemy and the weather gets a vote and goes in and does its destruction. And then it's our job to go in. And we, while we can't defeat the weather, we certainly then can make sure that we that we uh, what our actions that we take after it gets its vote. And so um, it's nothing, nothing is any more satisfying than to watch folks that, that have just been through a terrible hurricane and you go in and they're shoring up their home and, and their home maybe didn't get completely destroyed, but they have no, no electricity. And again, as we talked about, without electricity, you don't have any of the other basic necessities. Uh, and in the life, you know, I guess in the South, we call it, uh, uh, well, you guys probably call it air conditioning where you're from, but in the South, we call it life support, right? So without electricity, you have no air conditioning and no air conditioning during hurricane season is terrible. But to see those people get their electricity back rapidly i mean when i say rapidly it might you might think three or four days is not fast but when you see the destruction done to the system after a, a major hurricane and then see those crews go in and safely and so i can i've worked four hurricanes in the last uh, three years and um we had a, a absolutely just amazing safety records and it was the fact that that the companies allowed us to really get our, our coaches out in the field and you know, sometimes you have to move slow to move fast. And so we created good, deliberate work uh, and allowed the you know, electricity got put back together, but really with no no major harm, no loss of life uh, by the folks that were doing the restorations. And so nothing's more satisfying that to see those basic life services brought back to people who are in some pretty big despair after a major storm like that. And, and then to see it, see it come back and and then I just uh, wonderful people, the, many of the hurricanes we worked were in Louisiana. You see people that really their homes were destroyed, but they're out there cooking for the workers. They're out there cooking for their local community. And knowing that you have a part in bringing that power back to that local community, it um, it really brings back some faith in humanity when sometimes, it, you know, we did all this during uh, the, the height of COVID. And so when, when we probably all got down on humanity a little bit, I got to see humanity at its best. And so it was really I was really proud to be part of that. Yeah, one of the one of the things that's so encouraging about 
the best of humanity is is in the in the worst of storms to look and and see on highways this stream of utility vehicles and crews coming from all over the place uh, with with these mutual assistance agreements. Uh, so the the storm might be on the Gulf Coast, but in, inevitably you'll see crews from Texas and the Northeast and all these different logos and colors and everybody converging on one place to help each other. It really is something to be proud of and, and does uh, restore your, your faith in, in everything good about human beings. You know, error, errors happen in the workplace. Of course, we're, we're all humans and fallible. And, um, and then you mentioned earlier that, that a lot of the errors in the, in with, with protection and relays in our industry were attributable to, to human factors whether they be setting mistakes or something like that. So, so I suppose that the reduction of the number of errors, the error frequency and, and error severity are really the, I guess the benefits or the most positive outcomes of a, of a robust human performance system and its tools and techniques. Correct. Yeah. So, so David, we actually have a formula that we, that we share with everybody and, and we call it the remedy, right? The remedy for, a, a good um, yield. And so remedy is the reduction of errors in a company by employing those tools that, that can go in there. Like for example, the human performance tools, none of those, spo- those tools speed up your work. What we actually find is they make sometimes what would be automatic. It'll, it'll slow it down to where you can actually then reduce the error, especially when we see those times that it's critical where speed is not to be gained by how fast you can do it, but how accurate you can do it. So so we employ tools to reduce error. The M is we manage change. So in that, sometimes an organization has to understand where its role is in reducing those errors by sometimes organizations create undue time pressure, even if it's just perceived, right? It causes people then to change their behavior. And so we all know under time pressure that we don't have that clarity of thought that we might want. And we teach things like the reduction of working memory size under pressure. And that's the very predictable psychology, the science of psychology. And then we put in those error defenses because we look at where in the organization, maybe you have a latent organizational weakness that's actually attributing, it's setting the conditions for humans to have a higher error rate. So we reduce errors, manage change, error defenses, and that produces the yield that you want, which is informed executives, empowered leaders, and engaged employees. R-E-M-E-D-Y, remedy. And it's, it seems simple enough, but we employ that across really the different parts of the organization, either whether you're an executive, you have a role. If you're a leader, you have a role. And if you're an employee, you have a role. And so sometimes people just kind of think, well, everybody kind of does this human performance thing the same way. And we actually argue, no, depending on where you are in the organization, you have a different responsibility in the human performance program. And, and it's doing that part as a, either a role as a leader or as a role or as a follower. Uh, doing that role the appropriate way will produce that that what you want, right? Informed executives, empowered leaders, and engaged employees. And uh, we really believe in it. it. Again, you look at things like uh, aviation, you look at uh, nuclear power, you look at those things where we just can't have the error, and and they don't. They just have been able to do it successfully. Now, I don't want to give aviation, aviation too much credit. They land the planes before they work on them. But a lot of the stuff that we do, we work on it while, while it's still live. But yeah. we do that through that deliberate reduction of errors like you were talking about. So, so David, it, it does work. And, uh, and we I employ it in your own life. We don't want people just to use it at work. We try to get people to use this stuff at home. Uh, use it with your teenagers and driving. And you want to really learn patience, you know, have a teenager who's driving. And many of you probably do. So you know what I'm talking about. But this stuff does work uh, because we are really good. Humans are amazing at what they do. But sometimes we have to slow ourselves down and be more deliberate when we want to be error free. Yeah, I was exercising some of that patience last Saturday, teaching my 15 year old son, Wade, how to drive a, a manual transmission uh, car for the first time ever. So we, we had a lot of stop and starts. And, and uh, at one point, he, he mistook the, the brake for the gas or the gas for the brake. And, and that was a, that was luckily there was a, nothing but clear grass and field in front of him. But. Um, so I, I got to live that a little bit this past weekend. It, uh, one of the coolest things ever, James, was at, at one of the human performance conferences. I got to meet Chris Hart, a uh, former chair of the National Transportation Safety Board. And he, and he was one of our co-authors on the paper that you mentioned earlier that we wrote with NERC. 
And and Chris has this famous saying that good people trying to do the right thing make mistakes. And I I like that you hear a theme in your conversation here that that errors aren't bad luck, um, and and perhaps errors are inevitable. But this fundamental tenet that I keep hearing over and over again is that these error likely situations are are predictable and and to to great extent preventable and controllable. And isn't isn't that the whole point of of this? I guess if Dave Whitehead, our CEO, was here, he would say hope is not a plan. So, so David, we say luck is not a strategy, yeah. and and so uh, so very similar. Let's just take driving for example. We we've all um, parked in parking lots. We park in parking lots all the time whenever we go anywhere. And there's you can do things to set yourself up for success. So so when you go into an active parking lot, you should always pull into the parking space such that whenever possible you're actually driving out of the parking lot. You're driving into the active traffic way. And so what do I mean by that? Well, when you pull straight into a parking spot, when you're now ready to leave, you're now have forced yourself. You've created the error likely situation that I have to back into an active, because where anywhere else in the parking lot, if you're not parked, it's an active part of the parking lot. So you don't want to back into an active part of a parking lot. And you say, well, okay, but when you back in, you're still backing in. Yes, but you're backing into a non-active part of the parking lot. So, so if you just, it's really, it's a game of statistics, right? So statistically, what is the most dangerous thing for me to do? Well, the most dangerous thing would be to back into an active pathway. So set yourself up for success. So an organization can simply say, we're going to set the conditions where you don't ever have to back into a parking lot. And even if you do, you're going to back into it when it's the non-active part. That way, when you leave, when you're you're least likely of knowing what's going on when you're leaving, you're going to leave in such a, a place that you're you're driving forward into the active spot, and then you do a 360 because the conditions may have changed since you parked. Something could have gotten underneath your car, behind you, uh, you know, heaven forbid, a, a small child, whatever the case may be. So really, all you're doing is you're constantly lowering the risk. You're lowering the probability, the risk, and, and and how much risk you're willing to accept. And then lowering the probability that something else is going to happen to you. You're taking luck out of the equation and you're making it. You're, you actually have an error reduction strategy to actively mitigate risk. And that's what we teach in every single thing we do, whether it's parking in the parking lot or whether you're actively going in and getting ready to uh, check a line, make sure it's de-energized, ground it and, and service the utility line. It's all being deliberate and, and literally managing your risk down to where you, you make that risk to where it's as, as least as possible. And now you're not relying on luck. It's just good, deliberate work. So you mentioned some of the error traps that, that can get us in trouble. Um, you, the time pressure was the, one of the examples you used earlier and, and you can think of maybe overconfidence or ego or vague guidance or, or uh, procedures, maybe distractions. What are, what are some of the other traps that, that causes trouble with, with uh, respect to work or, or doing anything in our personal lives too. Well, I really like that you just nailed kind of what we call our, our core four in the terms of traps, right? Time pressure, overconfidence, distraction, and vague guidance. Um, I think the only one you didn't mention was distraction. And, and of course we all know about the cell phones and well, in, in, in fairness, car, I, right? In, in fairness, I did take a knowledge line, human performance fundamentals class <laughs> online. So well, there you go. So, so we believe, okay, so there's, I, I could name out a, a, a jillion traps, right? Um, but, but those four traps right there, we find in the predominant, in, in the literature, we go look at accidents, we look at root cause and all of us, uh, all of the, the leaders at Knowledge Mine have been very, very well versed in root cause analysis and have participated in hundreds of them. We find that those four things just keep popping up, time pressure, overconfidence, distraction, and vague guidance. And so we believe if, if you look for those four things, those four traps, if they're if they're prevalent, then you have just set those conditions such that the risk is too great, right? You've created you, uh, an error likely situation because you know that you haven't mitigated risk when one of those four traps are there. And so what we try to do is we look at tools that would help prevent that. Things like a self check, right? I mean, who would ever go in front of somebody without making sure first that they don't have they have all their stuff? I, I like I was a paratrooper in the army. You know, I don't just use a self-check. I also had a peer check. I had someone check my parachute. I, I did the best I could when I put it on, but I certainly didn't trust myself enough that it was important enough that that parachute worked. I also had a peer check and that peer would come make sure my parachute was worthy 
airworthy and, and we're going to work when I jumped out of the airplane and, and I jumped out of a perfectly good airplane, by the way. But, um, but then if things didn't seem right, you have a questioning attitude. And, and when you have a questioning attitude, then you have that effective communication that you're able to articulate. Here are my concerns. Are we suddenly facing more risk than we need to at this particular time? So, so yes, there's lots of stuff, but we kind of really try to boil it down to four tools and four traps to really make things more manageable. And there are going to be times when clearly there's going to be something else. But, but we found if you can eliminate those four most prevalent, that you're in a great path to, to be air free. As, as I was listening to you talk, I was remembering uh, one of your colleagues, Riz Shaw at the Department of Energy, uh, said once at your conference um, that that he or a colleague would would do a, a pre-flight walk around a helicopter in the Army, and and he would mentally prepare himself for the the importance of that mission by taking a deep breath and asking himself, "What's going to kill me today?" And it was I, I vividly remember that that part of his speech, and it was a. It was almost like a mental calibration, but it, it does remind me of this this questioning attitude, like questioning everything, not not assuming and and taking a real hard look at the um, whether it's big sources of energy or, or big um, uh, risks to whatever you're doing and taking those seriously and putting yourself in the right frame of mind for that job. Yeah. No, so, David, I just want to pull that thread, if you don't mind. So, so think about that is is that question attitude. But I know that you really are big. And, and one of the things I think that you took away from our conferences years ago was this idea of culture, right? And so, so that questioning attitude is that means the youngest person, the most inexperienced person in the room, uh, the, the, uh, the one, you know, it's a room full of all females and the male or the room full of all males and the female. Everybody has to be comfortable enough to be able to express that questioning attitude, right? And, it, and it's not a questioning attitude of, of like an you know it's it's we always try to separate it's a questioning attitude which is not the same as an attitude right <laughs> so i'm not just trying to get out of work here by saying i think this is unsafe i'm simply asking i don't either don't have the experience the knowledge or the understanding of what it is that you're trying to do right now and i and i'm i think it's my job to have a questioning attitude to make sure that we all understand and it may be just me but i want to make sure that everybody understands and so you have to have a culture that will accept that type of, of behavior. And so this is the part where we talk about, is it human performance or is it organizational performance? And the answer is it's both because my human is only going to be able to do what the organization allows them to do. And that organization sets up the conditions for them to be able to do. And so, so question attitude, easy to say, not necessarily easy to implement if you don't have an organization that's ready to listen to the most junior person or even the most senior person when they want to know have all these things be, been considered or, or if they, in, in fact, we call it a mental model, right? So, so David, what I'm thinking about something is it needs to match what you're thinking about something. And we both have to understand the system well enough of how it works and our mental models have to match. And when they don't, and our, if I have any belief that my mental model doesn't match your mental model, I owe you a questioning attitude so that we can say, hey, let's get lined up. Let's make sure we're both singing from the same sheet of music, even though neither one of us can sing that well. One of, you know, I'm glad you brought up the this courage that it takes and in, in the environment that you have to have to allow that questioning attitude. One of the fundamental concepts of human performance strategies is is a, a stop work policy or this you know if you see something say something type of uh, policy in your in your uh, in your work. And I've always found that that's easier said than done. You you had some great examples of if you're the newest or the youngest or the or or feel that you, for whatever reason, you're not comfortable enough in your own skin or, or to speak up. That's, that's really dangerous, isn't it? And, uh, and boy, it takes, it takes a special kind of environment and, and trust among everybody on the job site to facilitate that, um, that safe place where people speak up and, ha and, and it also speaks to the responsibility of all of us as individuals to, to show that courage and speak up. Well, and David, when, when if you look at when most accidents occur, a lot of times they occur late in the afternoon when, when you're wrapping up the, the work and you're, you're trying to you know come to fruition. And when you suddenly are slowing the work down or stopping the work when it's almost time to go home and we get that, that disease called get home-itis, and, and you're really going to make – it's really unpopular. and That's huge pressure 
even on the most experienced person out there to know that you're now causing everyone to be later uh, from work. And so understanding the pressure that one is under uh, when they when they call a stop work. And, and you know, David, at our conference um, uh, last month, uh, I know that you were a speaker there and we were very excited to have you come and speak. And, and I know that you would have enjoyed. We had a golf tournament. We had you know, all kinds of fun things set up. And you called me and said, hey, I, I, you know, I don't have necessarily COVID right now. I just recovered from COVID. I don't know. And, and you had to call stop work. And, and you know, I personally know that, that you would have enjoyed coming to the conference, but you also understood the personal responsibility that you didn't want to, you know, you knew that you were positive enough or close enough to having been positive to COVID that you didn't want to spread it. I mean, it's the same courage. And, and uh, now, what do, do we ever commend people? Do we ever get excited. And in fact, I always look at there's a responsibility for a system operator to shed load uh, if they need to stabilize the, the bulk electric system. That's a horrible thing. You have to voluntarily turn off, you know, hundreds, thousands of people's electricity. And uh, it's, a, it's a tough call to make. And in fact, if you were wrong in doing it, you might turn off the wrong people's electricity and you don't do really anything to, and then everybody loses their power. So, so it's just a, it's, it's a very strange position to be in. And you have to have a rule in your in your book, in your uh, operating procedure inside your control. And you have to have a rule that says that if necessary for the stabilization of the bulk electric system, I am authorized as a, the controller in charge to shed load. So you have to be you're giving formal authority by the by the uh, the CEO of that company saying that you know that you'll be trusted and backed if you shed load. So it happens. It happens on occasion. But, you know, I've never gone into a control room. Every control room I've been in, by the way, has that rule inside their book, signed by the CEO, and, and it, it says, hey, you can shed load if you need to. But I've never been into a control room ever or even in the lobby of a control room that had a letter of accommodation for a controller <laughs> that actually shed load. Or a party for, for Joe or Susie who just got done shedding load. Yeah, yeah so, so it's very interesting. Yeah, so we, do we really commend people? for doing that hard right. I yeah. mean, we, we go, gosh, boy, that was really good that you did that. And gosh, I don't know if I could have done that. You, you hear those terms, but but do we really ever celebrate those people when they make those really hard decisions? So, so David, at some point, I'll, I will have a, a small party for you for not bringing <laughs> COVID to the rest of us. And I, But I do appreciate it. it's mature behavior that a man, you know, you clearly could do that. But does everyone do that? Does everyone have that intestinal fortitude either because they're going to lose something privately, publicly, uh, you know, professionally, um, just because the, they didn't want to, they did not not want to miss out on the fun, the expense, all those different things. But then I give the example of, of when you have to do something really, really hard. Do we really celebrate that? And, and, and I don't think we do. And I think that, you know, if you look at the Lasado line, it says there should be four positive things for every one constructive thing. So if I really want to give you some good constructive feedback, I should find four positive things to say before I do that constructive thing. And so as knowledge vine coaches in the field, we actually try to implement that. We try to find, because we're going to find constructive things that we need, some things that need improving. So we try to find four things that are being done right before we start talking about the things that we need to, to know. If there was something horrific going on, obviously we would stop work. We would do all the right corrections immediately, but but if there's just some chance to, to give some constructive feedback, why not let's focus on the positive first and then we'll go for there. And just, just for any listeners, uh, the Lasato line is a, a, a large basis of research and whether it's exactly four to one, I mean, relation, there's just different things it talks about. People love to have that positive feedback in turn with that constructive feedback. And it said successful marriages actually have a 13 to one ratio. So 13 positive things for every one constructive same thing. So, for all our listeners, I would tell you to maybe you want to stew on that a little bit. I'm writing that one down. That's going to help me out. So you mentioned this challenge of maybe you know, maybe we we can do much better celebrating the hard choices. So that that leads me to another question here about the opportunities or challenges uh, related to using human per- performance to improve the reliability of the of the power system in the electric power grid. So so what do you what do you feel like there's still left to do and and what are the biggest challenges for us to tackle using human performance with respect to improving reliability so so david it, it is a uh, it's a great question i thought you know i was so proud of, of our attendance at these conferences that we did with nerc but remember nerc, nerc really is a regulator for the bulk electric system and uh, and now 
Um, and and I, NERT doesn't hold a human performance conference anymore. And so one of the reasons that, that we, you know, started the human performance in action conference this year was we wanted to kind of fill that gap uh, because what about all the distribution companies? What about companies that aren't even big enough to be regulated by NERC? We found a lot of them coming to the human performance conference. What about gas, natural gas? And, and so, and was it really even the role of the regulator necessarily to, to hold it? But when, when the regulator isn't holding it, we certainly didn't want there to be a gap because we found the industry certainly wanted it. And I thought that, you know, the, the market was saturated. Everybody knows what human performance is. And, and, and when you really go down to, you know, small co-op or a, a small utility somewhere that they might not, they don't know what human performance is, or they might say that, well, I know what it is, but um, you know, we just, we don't really call it that. And then you start listening to their vocabulary and they don't have a good set term. In fact, what we used to say is I'm not really going to teach you how to do anything that you don't already know how to do. We all know how to check ourselves off in the morning and make sure we're dressed. Right. But I'm going to call it a self-check. I'm, I'm going to give you a new vocabulary. And what you find is, is that when you have a vocabulary and you have a common vocabulary, it suddenly allows us all to communicate much more rapidly. And, it, and it's that part we were talking about, about building a mental model. When you create a common vocabulary, you suddenly can have much more in-depth conversations. You can have more succinct conversations. And the fact is you can have the conversations. In psychology, we have a thing called the Warfian hypothesis. And it, it says if there's not a word for something, can you even have that thought? Now, it's pretty deep, I know, but you take the the, the American Eskimo, and, and I think there's like, a, a, it, there's over 20 words for the word snow, because that's a very big part of the, of the Eskimo's life, right, is snow is a big part of their world. And so they have a lot of words for it, because they're trying to describe something that's an integral part of their life. And so we found was by creating this common vocabulary of human performance tools, human performance traps. Now we can convey thoughts much more rapidly, much more succinct, and get everybody on the same sheet of music. So am I teaching you how to do anything that you didn't already know how to do? Probably not. But am I teaching you your vocabulary that allows you to spread that with others, have open communication? And then, and then it, it becomes a little bit of a, of a religion, so to speak, right? I don't want you to strap this on. I want it to be part of everything you do. I want you to do a 360 around your car, whether it's in the workplace or whether it's in your driveway, where in your driveway there's even a greater risk of running over something that, that you didn't know was underneath your vehicle. And so, uh, so that, that idea of just creating that, that common vocabulary so that I, we make it where everybody can have that conversation. So one of the things that, that really strikes me listening to you there is let me, let me back up a bit. I think most people think of, of SEL as a, um, an inventor, designer, manufacturer of, of products of blue boxes that do things. And, and that's certainly true, but about a third of what we do is uh, in the realm of engineering services and a service provider and, and helping people build systems and uh, design and install and commission those. And SEL is, is not unlike other people that do this work. We, we, do, we do work for a variety of customers and locations and industries and, and regions of the world. So we don't necessarily go to work and see a common standard, a common interface, you know, a common uh, um, hu human machine interface, if you will. So it's, it's that much more important, I think, for our employees and people that do work like us to have that common set of um, terms and that common language and understand the fundamentals of, of error traps and, and error prevention tools. So, so, David, while I did say that, that the uh, environment and the context is important, right? If, I, if I'm British, I'm going to deconflict to to the mm -hmm. uh, to the left. If, I, if I'm American, uh, North American, I'm going to deconflict to the right. Uh, so, context does matter. But but when you really get down to the basis of human behavior, how the eye works, how the ear works, how how the human touch it, it affects us, it's all the same. No matter where you're at, where in the country you're at, that that piece never changes. The human behavior. Um, but but even then, uh, it's it is important to understand the, the uh, culture. So, so different cultures we've learned through the study of aviation accidents, different cultures have a little bit more challenge with the, uh, for example, a uh, question attitude, uh, because if there's somebody in charge, it's not as easy, for example, to stop work in different cultures. But so so it is important to understand humans, but then it's also important to understand the context that they work in. And so that's what I love about 
I mean, SEL is located in so many different countries. That's the beauty of diversity, the beauty of the United States, uh, of North America. We're diverse. Uh, you know, you, you can, uh, it's just so much fun to work with everybody because everybody brings their culture to the table, but we do assimilate. We assimilate. And so then we do become pretty predictable as North Americans. But as you go to other countries, you know, you do have to be aware of that, of that context and culture. And, uh, and so that's what makes human behavior so much fun. So as a psychologist, you, you think you have it all figured out, but then you change the context or you change the culture and it becomes exciting again. One of the, one of the things that really appeals to me about this whole topic, James, is is this humility of recognizing that human beings make mistakes, and that's okay. We accept that, but the the real goal here is continuous improvement. And and I think what resonates with me in 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 light of uh, SEL, one of our values, of course, is quality, and we talk a lot about working in a spirit of continuous improvement. And so I I, I just find that I'm drawn, I think, to this the this whole field and, and, uh, um, realm of human performance, because at the heart of it, it, it's all about just making a little bit more forward progress and improving constantly. Never, you're never really done. Are you? No, David, that's a great point. Imagine a, a professional baseball player. I mean, you wake up every day to read about all the errors that you made the day before. Um, but think about that. All those professional athletes, I mean, they make lots of money because they're very, very good at what they do. Well, how do they do that? They do that through coaching. Right. There's somebody constantly looking at them, providing that valuable feedback of something that they can't see themselves. It, it always reminds me of the adage we say you can't smell your own room. And, and so think about that. You, you can't you can't smell your own house. You, you have no idea what your house smells like. And so I, I would encourage you to ask your neighbor to come over and say, hey, hey, come over and, and smell my house. I know I know it sounds weird and I'll return the favor for you. But but wouldn't you want to know? what your house smells like, because you have no idea. And, and, you know, it could be that they just don't maybe like the smell of the particular candles or something that you use in your house. And so, you know, coaching is relative. You, you want to take, take it all in and decide what pieces you, you can use and what pieces you don't want to use. But, but for goodness sake, if they came over and told you your house stinks and most people wouldn't like the smell of it, wouldn't that be like kind of very, very valuable information that you have people over your house and your house stinks. And so, Coaching is so important, and yet I don't know that we we give out. I mean, we probably don't receive it that well. And so then because we don't receive it well, we're hesitant to tell others. But gosh, I certainly would want to know if, you know, with the old toilet paper on your shoe or the booger on your nose or whatever, I certainly would want to know that. So so if there's something that maybe that doesn't meet that threshold, but there's something that could make me better, I certainly would like to know that. And so that's really, to me, what the spirit of this idea of continuous improvement is, is my gosh, we can all make each other better and I want to be better. So it's all, you know, find that close circle of friends, find that, that close circle of, of, of colleagues. And it's really nice to have a friend at work, uh, you know, but find that those people that you can trust and get that coaching and give that coaching. And in that spirit of continuous improvement, because for gosh sake, if professional athletes, literally the way they get that way is we scrutinize every single thing they do. And maybe I don't want that, but I certainly would like to start to get closer to that. And the only way we're going to do that is through coaching. And so encourage it, encourage it and give it. So I, I would be remiss if I didn't shift gears here in, in, in stress safety. I, I have this, this thought or saying that quality and safety are inextricable, that uh, I can't imagine doing poor quality work, but being very safe or, doing great quality work and being unsafe. I, I think they go hand in hand and, 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 and knowing that safety is so critical to the electric power system and, and to the humans that care for it, use or benefit from it. Do you have a particular memory or story or, or experience James, where you saw human performance tools in action, preventing a, a serious potential safety accident? Well, so there, you know, I always go back to the old adage, if you don't have time to do it right, when do you have time to do it over? And, and so you look at just this idea of slowing work down to make it much more efficient, effective, reliable, but it actually results in the work, overall body of work being faster. And so, you know, if you think about uh, the number of times that, that I watched crews where they, if they just hurried up, they could be done one last pole set, one last 
you know, whatever. It's always the one last thing. And in fact, we, we used to have a thing when we would go snow skiing as kids, you never told the mountain it was your last run because you were afraid the mountain would hear it and, and take advantage of you. Well, when you get hurt, it's always your last run. So, but the point is, is that, that slowing guys and gals down to get that work done safely, you know, once the error trajectory gets through to actually cause harm, there's nothing good that's going to result from that. You're, everything from that point on is going to be pushed to a crawl. The, the, the whole site might have to then be ster you know, protected and, and nobody can move anything. And now nothing gets fixed. There's the, the number of, of family members that are affected by it. So there's just nothing, nothing that speeds up by racing to an error where there's an actual safety infraction. And, and so that's that, it's that whole care factor. I know that in the, the SEL principles of operation, right? It, it talks about individuals have to care. And really, I mean, that's what it is. It's, it's care for yourself. It's care for others. And realizing that when you get harm, the harm doesn't stop with you. It's all the people around you, whether it's your crew, your family, your workplace, all those rules and regulations that are out there right now, the majority of them are written in, in blood. It's not like somebody just made the rules hard for you to follow. It's because there those rules are in place for really good reasons, because it's caused a loss of life, a loss of limb, a loss of eye. And, and certainly there's going to be no, whatever time you thought you were saving is all lost when you take that shortcut because you, you think that that's the, what they want you to do. You think it's, that's the cool move. And there goes that coaching part again, man. If everybody really knew that the person next to them doesn't want to get hurt either, then it is okay to take that time and do that coaching. You coach me, I coach you. And, and then we all suddenly realize that's two of us. Now we're starting to talk about that's the organization. That's our culture. It's okay. It's not just me. It is care. It does matter. People really do around you want to be safe as well. They want you to be safe. And so you have to believe that. And that's that's that start and building that culture that allows all the things we talked about today, the, the, the culture of being able to stop work, the idea of continuous improvement. I really do believe humans want excellence. They just sometimes can't get out of their own way to get there. That you mentioned our our principles of operation in the in the the topic of caring. Uh, I'll, I'll read that quote that you're referring to for the audience. It says a key element to assuring that you meet success is caring about what you do. It may seem to be an intangible element, but without it, all other activities we undertake can only take us so far and never take us to the highest levels of success. And, and there was something really, really important that you said it, it triggered a memory. James, you, you talked about how, you know, if you get hurt, it doesn't just affect you. It affects your colleagues. It affects your family. And one of the things that we did here at SEL was we um, we had some external speakers, Gary Norland and Brad Livingston, come in and and uh, and talk to our employees. We recorded those talks and those are accessible to every single SEL employee. In fact, they're required um, as part of onboarding and safety training. But. Gary specifically talks about his accident and and how it forever changed the life of his family and uh, and Brad you you mentioned how we're maybe at the end of the day or we're trying we're in a rush you know that was a, a common theme with both of these accidents they were trying to save a little bit of time and it ended up uh, in in just absolutely devastating accidents for themselves their peers. And uh, and their family, of course. So I uh, really appreciate you bringing up the the care, and that's that's a that's a great way to to wrap up. I, I did want to to ask you, you: you just completed your first human performance in action conference with Knowledge Vine in August. How'd the conference go, and and what are you looking forward to in the future? Oh, David, it went great. We were so excited. Uh, well over two hundred uh, folks attended uh, from all over the U.S., uh, Northeast, West, the coast. Uh, it was just so much fun. Uh, we still are meeting as a community uh, in the human performance community of practice. And you can find that on our Knowledge Vine website. Anybody can join that. It's free every other Thursday. All right. So, well, we've we've plugged your human performance and action conference. And uh, I, I do have to mention one more thing. I, I, I want to thank you. I, I got to my desk this morning and there was a, a James Merlot autographed copy of the book Remedy, the formula for an evolving human performance culture. Uh, so thank you, James, for the, the free copy of the book. Would you it's 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 a 
published this year, brand new thing uh, available for folks. Would you share a bit about the purpose and the benefits of the book? And if somebody wants a copy, how do they go about getting a copy of your book? Well, so David, thank you. The book is on Amazon. And uh, what that book is, is that we just like our matrix and I gave you the remedy formula, nothing that we do. Uh, our secret sauce is not a secret. We absolutely want to show everybody how we do this. And that's what the book does. It dissects step by step the remedy process, how we believe coaching works. It'll have all that stuff that I talked about. You can't smell your own room. It'll talk about the fact that that you need to give those positive affirmations for the good work, then how we apply human performance in the field. Just glad to share it. Well, James, I want to I want to thank you so very much for for joining us today, talking about uh, your experience and career and talking about human performance and the value for our industry. Uh, if we'll just learn from it and use it every day and sharing what you know, it's been a lot of fun. Very valuable. Thanks so much, James, for joining us and being our guest. David, thank you very much. And always a pleasure to visit SEL. Thank you for stopping by Schweitzer Drive. Join us again as we learn about, explore, and celebrate electric power. For more information about the show, please visit selinc.com slash Schweitzer Drive.